We are starting the new year with an awesome interview. I'm very much looking forward to this. It is, I should be writing season 18, episode four. Well, I should be writing. And hi there, welcome to I Should Be Writing, the podcast for wannabe fiction writers. I'm your host, Mer Lafferty. We stream on Twitch live uh, twice a week at 3 o'clock Eastern Time, and then we put it in the feed so you can get this later as a podcast or you can get it right now. Um, I have with me Nicole Glover, author of The Conductors. So, uh, hi, Nicole, welcome to the show. Hi, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm really glad to have you. Um, there's so much to ask about your work and your career so yes. far. I'm excited. Uh, we usually start the show with uh, me trying to do, uh, now I can't think of the word. I'm trying to tell people that I'm riding along with them. That that There's a word that goes with that. Uh, anyway, I am, I did 2,000 words today on a battle scene that I was not expecting. So <laughs> that should be be interesting to put into my outline after I write it. But um, yeah, so I, I'm glad I got that done. Uh, Nicole, do you want to report any uh, writing work you got done today or not? You can not. Uh, not yet. My my writing stuff doesn't t happen to the evenings. I have work today. So. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So I, I usually save my writing for the after work. I, mean, I might, you know, jot down a few notes or something like that. I think I had, I've been Right, I guess right now I'm figuring out, I'm starting a new new draft, new story stuff. Mm -hmm. And I've been, been kind of, I, I hit the wall about 40,000 words, I think last weekend or so. Oh, Realizing, no. of course, the big, big problem was something in earlier I did, basically. Yeah. I had, like, I'm in that, since I'm stolen, I'm going, so I hadn't really got to the point. So this is the point where I start outlining, where I start figuring out little details. So basically, I spent this week kind of going, trying to figure out that one area that, to fix things. And I think I, I think I found it so I can probably this weekend hopefully start moving further into like the first draft phase. So excellent. Yes. Um, and we're going to do a quick spot of good news. Uh, things keep going on for me, nothing new and exciting. Um, but if you guys have any good news, let me know in the chat. And if you're listening to this later and you've got good news, then email me and say you've got good news in the subject, and we'll put it on the next episode. But I'm here, I'm ready with the applause and the yay button, so if y'all have good news, please let me know. Oh, we don't have the rejection thing on here. <laughs> we're, we're counting rejections this year. Rejection counter is at one right now. People are high-fiving in the chat for Night Riders Unite, so you've got uh, some buddies with you. So you're not yes. alone. Uh, Under Pope's COVID test came back negative. That's awesome. Yeah. Apparently just a cold. That's good. I think I'll go ahead and get started with Nicole. If you have any good news, please don't hesitate to put it in the chat. We will mention it uh, later. And I'm just excited to talk to Nicole because your work is fascinating because it's, there, there's just so much. First, tell mm -hmm. us about the, uh, the books and yes. i have them here i'll be giving these away by the way so we're going to do a giveaway of both books i'm yay. excited for that free books <laughs> yay free books yes the murder and magic novels yes these the murder and magic magic series follows a pair of a of, of magic uh mystery solving magic users a hetty and benji Rhodes. they're a married couple who in the past were partners in crime as underground railroad conductors and 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 now since it's been about five years, five six years since the end of the Civil War, and they're in Philadelphia and they're figuring out what they want to do next to their lives, and they're like, let's solve mysteries because that's where their their talents lie, basically. So they basically solve mysteries, magic mysteries, murders, and stuff around their community in Philadelphia. And basically, the the first book sees them take some more take on a more personal murder as a close friend of theirs is found dead, and they have to go diving in. 
into figuring out who did it, why, and it's yeah, it dives into community and friends, and this leads to all unexpected places, basically. And yeah, that's the both books are pretty much standalone. There's mysteries of this them figuring out this exploring the world and just having fun with the the magic side of mystery solving. Excellent. So as I said in the uh, episode title, you're you're blending, you're mashing three genres together because you did a lot of research for this to be alternate history as well as magic fantasy as well as uh, murder mystery yeah i did it's a <laughs> i i i guess it, i i was been working on it for so long. i really don't think it's i kind of it's, it's like a piece that's kind of work together so i think i just i kind of view like the history side of the, the scene setting it's like the part of the world building it's like that's what i use to set the the the, the place basically and I guess in the, this view is like the mystery is it's the, the engine for the plot and the, the magic is the fun elements that kind of everything ties it together. <laughs> and I guess it makes sense in my mind. It's, it's all like one thing. It's not really, I guess it, I don't really, it kind of, it just, all this kind of came together in a kind of natural way as I was just plotting out these stories. I started out with a simple idea of these characters and kind of exploring the, the time period and just, it all just kind of came together <laughs> in a way that it's, and it's a little genre of mashing, which is a lot of fun. I like I find I it's I like I like pulling in different aspects of different things and it gives me some flexibility. So I don't it's cause it's hard to write a a sort a straight historical fiction story because you feel like you have to adhere to all the dates and details right. and get make everything pre- precise. You gotta look up the weather, see if it's actually snowing or sunny <laughs> oh, on wow. day. You know, it makes you, you don't have necessarily have to, but you, sometimes you feel like it, like, you know, and there's a lot of times when I was doing research, I was like, am I, am I researching, like, you know, if they had toothpicks or whatever things or certain inventions were made or like when certain pieces of like uh, music or plays or things like that happened. And, then, you know, then a lot of times I end up pulling back, remembering I have magic in this world, so I can like be fuzzy about certain things. If the bicycle right. was invented earlier is is more popular than it was at this time it's fine because i have magic going on so yes so mm-hmm. there's things like that and also be able to blend i guess the magic side of things into kind of pre-insisting history of this world because i said it in you know a, a world that in the u.s that's not too different from our own i keep it pretty close to history because i wanted to play with the historical times and blend some magical aspects of certain things of just of like kind of basically heightening like of of things that are already in history, whether it's like uh, looking into certain laws of that time period and adding a layer of like what happened, people have magic, what laws would people have about who can do magic, who can't do magic and all those different things like that. And just kind of just playing with that blend. It makes it fun for me in a sense of just the right and to create things and just imagine the world in itself. Well, that's, well, it's awesome because I, yeah. I think it sounds a little bit like you're doing the, well, it was easy for me, so clearly it's not that impressive. It just sounds like you're very comfortable writing in this historical mm-hmm. setting. And that's awesome. Because yeah. if it was me, I would like go down every single rabbit hole because I'm not really a student of history. And in mm-hmm. hindsight, I, I kind of think, I want to go back in time and say, don't study other writers. Study yes. how things happen in mm-hmm. society and understand that and then you can write stories about it but yeah i didn't yeah. do that but uh i think the problem is you know the the way we view history a lot of times especially i guess from school it's kind of just notes and facts and you miss all the fun like interesting details about things like you don't learn about like a certain cultures having like certain like early machines or steam engines or like you know having roads like you know really 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 built roads and like out in like places in South America, mm-hmm. for example, or just unique interesting stories of like tidbits you don't hear about because we just have a really flat view of history, and and then and also since you have this facts and then you know they make they make it boring too because they they, they take out people actually lived in these times because we just. We just view things as like these are numbers, these are mm-hmm. these are wars, mm-hmm. these are battles, these are the politicians, these are like the the certain scandal, these are like legislations and you know kings and queens and all the the terrible things that happen, <laughs> plagues and all that stuff. And you forget about how people live day to day and stuff, and it's just fascinating to kind of pull back and think of how people live day to day, like you know how it's all of those different things and. I don't know. I guess maybe because I think it also probably helps. I was 
I always liked history as a, as a kid. I read a lot of little history, historical fan, historical fiction books as a kid. I liked, you know, history in general. I guess I like, I like learning new things. I mean, it doesn't help too. I grew up in Virginia, which the history of the U.S. is taught a lot. And, mm-hmm. and I lived in all the, or lived around all the big historical areas. Lived around Yorktown, lived around uh, the Massive Civil War, all this other stuff. So all the history stuff that that gets talked about of some prominence. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's around me and stuff. And I guess, right. Right. so I guess I was, I guess pro- that probably helped in that, in that sense. And I don't know, I guess also with coming with history is I always, I guess I'm always been intrigued by how, I guess they always say like the whole thing about history is that you don't repeat it. Like it's a history is a circle, that sort of thing. Like you see things, you look, see, you see things in the past and you can just change the names and dates and it's yeah. like pretty yeah. much present. And it's, it's fascinating and both in, from an objective point of view is, the same patterns and also terrifying the same that we keep making the same mistakes over yeah. and over again. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you there. Um, we've got some comments in chat saying, uh, Catwood is from Williamsburg and totally gets what you mean. Grew up with a lot of historic fiction and history field trips. Um, yes, in North yes. Carolina, we did too, but I'm from the mountains and nobody talks about the mountains. They talk about like the, the coast and the, the colonies mm-hmm. and stuff. So, yeah. um, so about the the mystery and fantasy, are you well read in both of those, or did you? F- I, 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 this is not an insulting question because yeah. when I decided I was going to write a mystery science fiction book, I realized yeah. I didn't know about mystery, and I was rather frightened that I had just sold this book. So I was wondering if yeah. there was any aspect that you kind of panicked about and do- did like deep dives into. Oh, not really, because I had always been pretty well read as a kid. You know, I'm the, the, the typical bookworm. We read a bunch of different things because, you know, I went to all libraries, went from like school libraries, public libraries, or the little libraries and classrooms mm-hmm. from doing the books. So I've read, I've read a good thing. I mean, deeply, I'm pretty deeply read in fantasy. If I haven't read it, I might know, I'm at least I'm aware of like the big stuff, mm-hmm. basically. And yeah, I read a lot of little mysteries, whether it's like from the, the classic ones to like the random kind of like, you know, Babysitter Club mysteries. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, those things, those little adjacent things. So um, I felt pretty comfortable. I think, I think it's an occasion I, I might like brush up. I think I'd probably brush up with a couple more like this more, re- more re- try to read some more recent mysteries as mm-hmm. I got into writing because they always say it's best to it's good to read stuff that came out within like the past five years or so to get a sense of where the genre is or what's being sold that sort of thing yeah and as the, that's a benchmark yeah yeah the classics are they're classics for a reason and we study them for a reason yes. but when it comes to actually writing what sells today mm. you can't really rely on the classics yeah there's there's also there's been a shift I think I, I want to say that I read an article talking about the shift from like golden age detective stories to modern day, looking at basically for who's the, who's the protagonist, how the role of the police is, and basically all those different kind of tropes of the mysteries and how it moved from like more from a who done it to more of like why and yeah. how done it these days. And it's, it's, it, was a, it was a long time since I read it ago, but it, it was a fascinating thing to really think about like how. Just like one particular genre, we see like, you know, it's a bread and butter of like, you know, mysteries are always really popular. And that's probably why, like, you know, things like true crime and like CSI and stuff, it was really popular because, you know, the heart of things, murder, mystery is, is, is really popular, is really well liked. And it's been interesting to see the shifts of how we view certain things and how it's just probably kind of changed a bit. Yeah. And like you, uh, yeah, like you said about the, the why did they do it? I, when I uh, read the Save the Cat Writes a Novel uh, craft book, and she puts mysteries in the why done it category, not the who done it, because that's yes. more interesting, even though, of course, they're linked, but. Yes. Um, it is. So, one thing I found interesting, uh, you know, some people do prologues and somebody, some people hate prologues. <laughs> you have done something different in both of these books, which yes. is. Um, sort of open with news reports or in the conductors it was more mm-hmm. of i wouldn't call it news but more like uh yeah. pamphlets of wanted runaway slaves and yes. yeah mm-hmm. or wanted for stealing slaves yeah. and amendments and stuff so how did you come up with that that structure yeah. and because mm-hmm. it's really neat yes I read this in the book a while ago. I think it was Orleans. I'm blanking on the author's name, but it was a, a book came out about New Orleans, like a post opera. It's a young adult book that came out 
2000, I guess late 2010, 9, 8, 9. But it's, or, it's called Orleans. Orleans or Orlean. Mm-hmm. But basically, it had the same structure. They had, news, they had news clippings and stuff that opened the book. That And I really liked the style because it set up the history of, like, you know, for the past few years of this book's world about what happened in certain things. And I really liked that. And I thought that was a good way to open my world for the conductors because I wanted to establish from the get from the get go that this is a historical setting, but it also has magic in it. I want to have that magic and history was tied together right from the start. So that's why I made sure one of the opening things was kind of had kind of slipped in there. There's magic in these things. So you slowly got into whether it's like figuring out these what these characters kind of hinting. I also want it also hinted that to the main characters are because you get little bits of pieces of who might be the characters. And as well as some details about the world and it's kind of blend the magic in there. And I thought I really liked that. And I thought that was a good way to open it to give because I didn't want to didn't want to just flat out tell people from the start. Yeah. And yeah. And, so, and it also slowly gets people in there. And then, and it's funny because I think someone had mentioned to me that they actually thought it was a real clipping I had sent in there. Cause I wasn't I, like, I actually looked into like the wanted posters. I looked into newspaper stuff. I even looked at like the the legislation code stuff I based, I kind of mimicked. Mm-hmm. And I looked at that stuff to kind of mimic the, the kind of language of that time period, and and some some of them actually told me I thought it was real, and don't, even though they saw the magic part, yeah, I was, there, but... <laughs> I was just about to quote that: approach with yeah. caution and bring shock collar to subdue any magical attack. <laughs> yeah, like they. Yeah, I, I, I did. Yeah, but I like why that's why I liked it. I wanted to like slowly bring people in there and like, say, "This is here's magic in this stuff." Even if he didn't get, he didn't get from the cover, or, you know, read the blurb, that sort of thing. When you got into the book, because instead of just dropping it, even though you'd, you still, even though I still, I still drop the magic in there within the book when the book starts properly. But I just wanted this is another way to slowly bring people in there, and also it's this other details I wanted to just bring in there that I didn't want to that it won't, I was saving to, to slowly weave into the story later on. Because mm-hmm. I think as, I'm always worried about doing the info dump basically because there's so much details I want to bring in. Because I've established this how how much the magic is in this world, how this world functions, the magic functions and stuff, and I can't, I don't want to drop all that in there within the first couple of chapters because that's that's boring. It takes, yeah. people, it takes people out, and so I had to slowly. It's having those little articles in the front. There's a slow, a one slow way to get get that in there. That to, as I as I slowly weave my way into the book. So when I finally do a little info dump. It feels like a good spot for it, basically, because I gave you some, because I gave you some like information that is, that slowly been spooned out. So now I'm giving more context, basically. Yeah, um, I would actually argue that you do it quickly because you're mm-hmm. giving us information that, and you avoid every single trope that a lot of authors stumble upon, such as the as you know, Bob, like <laughs> you know, waking up yeah. and telling your husband that you do magic. <laughs> yes. And he knows this, but you right. need to tell it so the reader knows. Yeah. And it's like you, and you make people interested, but you don't, mm-hmm. it's not like a dry, omniscient narrator. So, right. I mean, it's just, there's so much you accomplish with these three little uh, wanted posters mm-hmm. oh, and the and the amendment. And then Undertakers does the same thing with uh, news newspaper clippings, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's 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 just like I don't know. It's like bringing the back of the book to the front of the novel and giving a little bit more detail. It, it's just very good for wetting the appetite and um, getting people yeah. interested. So, yeah, I wanted this. I guess I wanted to break up information throughout the book. Cause like even for like if you have the print version of the books, I'll have the constellation that's top open each chapter basically. Oh right. Because I wanted because since I use my magic system based on the constellations, I use I call them star so but they're basically the constellations. And because not, not everyone has a good memory for, for these constellations. Right. So I want to have a visual component. And I decided instead of having an appendix in the back, I wanted to have like, you know, the open up each chapter, like, you know, part of like the little chapter heading and have a little different constellation. And so, so people have a visual they could refer back to or in stuff or just even just keeps with the theme. Right. Stuff. I thought it was, it was, it was actually an idea I brought to my publisher and I was really happy. They said like, yes, let's do this. I really, I was really, I felt really strongly. I wanted to have information in there, right there for people to have on the page. No, I love it. It's really great. I just showed, uh, I just showed chat one, uh, one of the chapter headings so they could see the, um, the, the constellation. Um, Yeah. You, you, it just feels like you've done so many interesting things effortlessly, unlike 
every other writer trying to get this stuff or trying to describe a constellation mm. in prose or something. It's mm. just uh, very cool. Um, so this, what one thing we just uh, I discovered right before we started talking is um, these books both came out last year. And yes, yes, <laughs> that's like a whirlwind and a normal timeline. Mm -hmm. So what can you tell us about how, how did that happen? And how was that decision come up? How did it come about? Uh, well, we got to You got to You got to mention the pandemic playing a role into this because the conductors was originally meant for November 2020. And because of pandemic paper shortages and all this shuffling of, of the book from the schedule, it got bumped into early 2001. And Undertaker was always kind of set for the fall of 2021 anyway. And it's kind of, and they basically they wanted the pivots on there too. And I also got, I got, I was got to mention the conductors originally had November, it was November, November 3rd or whatever the election date was of 2020. Oh. That was the date it originally was. Oh. And no. I was like, when, when they first told me that about a, back in 2019, I was like, okay, are we going to do that? And I think the only thing I'm grateful for the pandemic is that got moved. <laughs> so, yeah. so it's like, yeah. I don't, I don't want to be looking, I want to be counting down to that date basically. But anyway, the, that's how the scheduling wise happened on the, on the editorial side. As for me, I had, this, I had sold the, I sold the conductor since 2018 and spent most of 2019 getting it ready to go basically. And I was also starting with the undertakers that same year, end of that same year. Because when I had sold the book, I had, I had only written the conductor at the time when I first sold it. And the editor was like, yeah, we really like this. We want to have another book, too. So basically, I had a two-book deal. And they said, let's do a, a direct sequel to the book. And I was like, okay. Because originally, my first plan was that I had, the, I had as I was researching the conductors, I had gotten really interested in other time periods, too. So I had, had this loose plan of doing different decades kind of set in this world. And so that was kind of my plan that I was initially pitching to editors about, but they're like, let's do a direct sequel to the conductors. And I was like, okay. I, had, so I always had ideas and, and plans for these characters. And I also really liked these characters. And it's even more as I was editing and getting the book ready for, for publication, I had all this stuff I ended up cutting that paid, became perfect father for the undertakers, basically. Oh, that's great. Yeah, like all the any kind of extra research, uh, cut characters, cut subplots, or had room for certain subplots. I didn't really tie up all the wedding conductors. I was able to be able to easily move the book in book two. So I basically had a really rough structure of what book two was going to be about, even as I was working on the on the first book to get that ready for for publication. So basically, I had, I you know it turned into uh, uh, conductors at the end of 2019. I start work on book book two at the end of 2019, going in. To 2020, and I turned that in, uh, I guess March, and then I, you know, I get back edits for the first book to work on, and it's basically a cycle of just mm -hmm. getting the first book ready and getting back edits from my editor for book two, and getting, then once the conductors is like done and do all the copy edits, final pass and stuff, I get all oh, I move into book two for that, and it, the timing was such that my copy edits were basically ended up a year apart for each book. I had copy edits conductors. In like the spring of 2020, I had copy edits for Undertakers in the, the spring of 2021. So it was like my even my copy editor was like, "This is a deja vu all over again." Wow! <laughs> so I had a lot of, I mean, I had like a lot of deja vu anyway. The start, the start of 2021. I even had even more <laughs> just going through that same process again. Cause it was, I looked at, I even looked at my old emails, and it was almost to the date of a year apart. Wow! And I mean, it was it was a lot of fun. It, it, one benefit of writing both books together is that I had a pretty good idea of how the certain subplots would link together things i wanted to kind of carry over i didn't have to worry about losing the voice of these characters because i know there's sometimes authors would say like they, they, they move to, between different projects they lose the voice of the world the characters a bit i didn't really i don't i don't think i got a really chance to lose that because it was mm -hmm. kind of really close together i don't know i was able to it's you know just kind of map out certain things and decide you know uh, like some things I got cut in book one, I could put in book two, and also just gave me the things of what I wanted to work with. And I also went in book two thinking, you know, here's some of the since the since the book one is about like setting up the world, uh, you know, getting getting introducing the characters, introducing to the magic, introducing some of the basic stuff. Book two was for me to have a little more fun of like expanding out the world, expanding, looking at other relationships within the book, 
I don't know, just having a having a boss, my main character is having adventures, you know, just solving stuff and just hanging out together and just bringing in some like fun little quirky things or things I like in book two. Because uh, book two, I was able to bring in my interest in underground tunnels, uh, mm-hmm. those ghost stories that I felt I read in book tales of even like a cipher <laughs> of like a, that they had to, that was that played like a, a subplot that was a thing, all that stuff. I even I even brought in a, a bookstore and a magical library in oh, this book. Nice. And so like it's it basically I was kind of I guess my thing is going in these books is I'm gonna write everything I like and make sure I get as much as possible that makes sense in the book, <laughs> and and that's all that's. That was that was the benefit of just having this all this stuff to coast together. And only the only side benefit is that it just all this stuff blurs them together. Because especially with the the kind of the marketing and talking about both books is that I had to especially with it's mostly with the book two when I started doing the publicity the as the book two was coming out, it was I was still talking about the, the conductors because you know it was still only it was barely you know six or seven months before the between the books. So I was still kind of talking about book one, even though I wasn't going to talk as much about book two. And I almost felt really bad about <laughs> book two because even though it's like, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's the same, same characters in the same world and stuff. I, just, I wasn't giving its own shine, you know, it's like it's older sibling was good, taking some attention, but I guess that happens when they're really close together. And I also, I do, I do also knew sometimes that not everyone, it's in between, you know, the short amount of time and everything else going on. Not everyone got the chance to read the first book. A lot of times I talk to some people who it's the first time they're hearing about book two. It's the first time they're hearing about the books, it's book two and like they're not sure there's another book and stuff. But I guess one benefit for me was that because they're mysteries, I was able to write things fairly standalone. So that it wasn't like, it's like, it's not, even though it's a series, it's not like a, a really tightly knit series. So that you had to have, you had to read certain things in order. I mean, you, it's preferred, you know, as, if they, as they always say, prefer to read them in order, mm-hmm. but it's not, that's not necessary. Right, and stuff. So right. that was one benefit. That's one benefit, I guess, being a mystery. That it makes mysteries popular in general because you can kind of jump in, jump in at any point. Because bearing some like long standing stuff, but it's usually, but it's usually not really a big deal. And most mystery series I read, because usually like, you know, relationships or like, you know, big enemies, that sort of thing. It's always a thing with other mystery series and stuff. But right. Yeah. I would love to ask you a question. I saw in your author note that you enjoy video games. So I wanted to ask you what you play. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of RPGs. I, I I just got off a year of like several months of being obsessed with Hades. Oh and stuff. yes, I, I love oh, yeah, Hades. I played two. I played it twice. I played two. I did two rounds of it basically from start to finish with both sides. Over two hundred hours. So it's just like I don't think I've ever did that many hours in a single game before. I mean, I played these RPGs. You know, you can rack in you know pretty fifty. Hundred and so hours, but it's right. the first time I did two hundred hours, hundred hours in one game. I actually, was able to aware of that, you know, in several months. But yeah, I could talk about oh, this, the beauty of this. It makes it how it rewards you for being bad at the game. The really easy for me, especially since I'm a UX person, of how easy it was to kind of just get the flow of how the understanding how the game is and stuff. But yeah, it's, I haven't. I actually put that. I had to put that down for a while. I think. The new stuff I've been playing, or kind of newish, one that's kind of new to me was Persona 5 that I've been playing. That's like a, a really fa- a really popular, like, I guess, a Japanese RPG yeah. game. Yeah. And because I, I mostly got I mostly got hooked on, started playing it because another UX person I knew had talked about the UI of this, how it was structured differently. So I thought I was going to give it a go. I thought it actually was shorter than what it really was. I thought it was only about 50 hours. And only to find out this game at the minimum was like a hundred game. Yeah. A hundred hour game. It's, it's, you, you have to do a speed run, basically. And I was like, oh, this is supposed to be my breather game. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> but anyway, it's, I think I also picked up um, on Steam on this, this is a game called Wilder Myth, which is like a, it's kind of a, it's kind of like a tabletop kind of, uh, like a, it's a kind of procedural game. Like it's like, it's generated, like it's like little stories. Okay. But it's like little sprites and stuff. It's kind of fun, even though like it's very generic stories that you kind of pick and play, but you can kind of customize how they look and you can in and stuff. It's kind of it's a little fun. I, it's, I think I played it a little bit a few weeks ago. It just it's like, like little things and stuff. But I'm also I got some other. I, I also bought some new games on sale. One of them I'm really excited to play is the uh, the Phoenix Wrights. Um, series yeah it's yeah. like you know, the lawyer games which i only started playing because i saw i remember from years ago that there was i guess they had some camcon versus marvel fighter game and phoenix wright was one of the, the fighters and i was just so amused 
about mm-hmm. the video of this of this lawyer character fighting like Marvel characters. I'm like, I got, I was like, I gotta find this game and find out like a little mystery kind of visual novel thing. I got, I recently just got the, I guess the one that, I guess it's, I guess it's like an, I guess it's supposed to be his grandfather or something, like a prequel in a sense. Okay. And I guess some people okay. were surprised it actually was actually localized because it's, I guess not many of those games come over the U.S. So I was win- waiting it for the come- go on sale for a while. So I finally was able to get, get that. So I'm, that'd be my next game to kind of play as like as a, as a, a, a true break between all the, the long RPGs I've been kind of playing. Right. Yeah. I put the link but, yeah. to Wilder Myth in the chat. Um, I try to remember, tell my producer to put it in this show notes. Um, also you'd mentioned, um, Orleans. Oh, was, here it is. Uh, thank you. Kids are asleep. Uh, Orleans by Sherry L. Smith was, uh, yeah. she found the author to that. Oh, yes. And yes, lots of people are are showing extreme uh, interest in Wilder Myth right now. So yes. lot, lots of people are playing it right now, apparently. Um, and that looks really cool. Yeah, it, it is. I was I was I was a, I was surprised how easy it was, kind of figure out what's going on, and even how attached I got to some of the characters. I think really? I just I did one did one round, and everyone died after a battle. I was like, I was so sad <laughs> oh, about no. this because I guess she kind of it's she in a sense in the game time you see him progress throughout I guess the career of being like adventurer and I was like you know I was trying to keep these characters alive and and then they, then they die even though I guess because it was near the end of the I guess the end of this little round of the game anyway so they just kind of died instead of like you know being to live on to another day so I was like I was kind of sad and so I actually I guess after I lost all the party I started a new game because I because I was so sad about it well sure yeah so um I want to talk to you about your website because it yes. is a level up by any author website I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. It's Nicole-Glover.com. And if you go to Nicole-Glover.com slash books, you see the covers for Murder and Magic. But then under that, mm-hmm. there are these, well, actually it looks like a, a game because you see cards. You see yes. a beautiful image of one of the characters. And on the right side is their information. So Henrietta Hetty Rhodes, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Sagittarius Sun, Capricorn Moon, etc. And you've got these for how many? Uh, it looks like eight, eight characters. Mm-hmm. So whose idea was this? How did you get the art? What? How did this happen? Because I, I want to totally copy you because it's oh, yeah. gorgeous. <laughs> yes, this art. Uh, I as from whenever I started from writing, it's like I always wanted to commission artists to write, to draw my characters, basically. I want always want to do that, and I knew when I I got the deal, I'm like I'm definitely have the money to actually pay some really good money to get some stuff done. Mm-hmm. And my ins- my main inspiration other is like the the clue cards like from the for the board game. Yes, yeah, because I I don't I don't add them on this website, but I also got some weapons like cards done too, like they're like different ones, like you know things like a like a, an axe, a potion bottle, a hairpin, that sort of thing. And I don't, I don't have it on this game, but basically, I like the, I, I was inspired by the, the clue cards as a way to, you know, just as a character card, and it was kind of fun. So I, was, I, I contacted this this artist, and it was like, and you know, kind of passed on this idea. This is what I wanted to do, and I gave a brief description of each character, and she just worked magic because I gave her mm-hmm. a brief description of things and all these all these details from like the, how the clothing is done, what they're what these characters are holding and stuff. Yeah. She did all that on there. I didn't tell her to do any of that. It was all from her. And I was like, she was like reading my mind and stuff. And it's like, that's the fun thing about work, working with artists. So like, kind of let them go. I just give them some details. So here's, here's the, here's what I kind of want and kind of let them go what they want to do with it. So yeah, it's like, that it was just such a joy to have this in there. And I knew I wanted, once I got those, like, I was like, I'm definitely going to have like a visual on my website to kind of just to introduce the characters. Because I think, I think that's a thing with a lot of mystery novels is they have a, a cast of characters, a, mm-hmm. a dramatis persona or something like that. So yeah, that's kind of the that's the idea I kind of brought in there. Because basically, like it's the main character. You see the main character Teddy and Benji, plus mm-hmm. the the main supporting characters. It's mostly their friends, and there's some other kind of key players that will appear appear in both the books. And so I think this kind of just brings the details in there. Some stuff that you know, like particular. It's also also I wanted to bring the astrology in there because you know there's a lot of stars stuff in this book. So it's like, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. I, 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 I like those things. I like that's part of the bio basically. But yeah, it's. And as for like the website itself, I'm, I'm really happy to say how it replaced your how how I put it together because I was it's, it's basically me using a 
taking advantage of the WordPress's um, like, you know, templates and kind mm -hmm. of making it work for me. I guess because since I have a background in tech and just kind of working as a UX researcher with, on the website, and I, I knew some basic, I'm not the best coder, I knew some basic stuff. But just a sense of how websites work and making sure everything works, looks nice on the phone as well as desktop and stuff. I, spent, I guess every so often I go around and just rearrange how things look and how make how you link to certain pages in there. I kind of re, rearrange just how things are laid out because, you know, I want people to be able to find things easily and easily because that's, I mean, that's my job. So I want to make sure my website's reflective of that. So that that makes a simple. lot of sense. UX yeah. is not easy. Yes. It's really not. Um... Also, I do want to tell people for uh, on the awards eligibility page, both the conductors and the undertakers are eligible for any novel awards. Um, so yeah, we're going to hope for that, definitely, because these are gorgeous yes. books. And you do realize with the art on this page, and if you've, got, if you've got art of items, you're like halfway to a game. You need maybe a little bit more art and some rules <laughs> and throw it up on Steam, man. This is this is really cool. That would be fun because I actually do have a little, little history in making games. <laughs> Back in high school, we had, I did this uh, project. It was big. It's like, a, it's like an end of year project that I basically built a board game. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh. I think it was based on, yeah, it was, it was, the uh, logic how I got to making a board game was that I did a research project about, um, I guess uh, well, like Joseph Campbell stuff about you know the 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 the, the, myths, the storytelling myths of like the circle of, like mm -hmm. the hero hero's journey basically, and I kind of I for the board game I drew on like different myths around the world as character as, as players to play in this game, and I just kind of basically just made up a board game <laughs> for it and stuff and in hindsight it's probably that wasn't the most exciting kind of gameplay but you know I put it together I made I actually made the board game made the pieces and everything like that. Got my first little um, Wacom tablet just to try out the, the to so I can draw out things for the board itself. I don't know if I still have it or not, or it, but I don't know if it's still. But my mom still has it or not. But it was a fun thing to make because I like. I guess cool. it's like those projects were always about getting to me do some artsy, crafty stuff. So yeah, yeah. So I do have experience doing that things. I'm not sure if I don't know if I, I don't know about now, but yeah. It's, there's always there's always the hope to find someone that's interested in doing things. I would love actually to make this world into a video game of some of some sort. That yeah. would be that would be amazing to me. Yeah, we got people saying uh, there's a good market for the visual novel games on Steam, so you could you could do I've that. Actually, I actually had played. Um, there's a there's a, this company. I guess I think Frogwares is like a Sherlock Holmes series. I actually played one of their games last year. Basically, it was actually it was actually really fun because it's you know other than like the little little um it's the sleuth solving stuff. Mm -hmm. It was like I really like the mechanic of like when you're going between like locations. Like for example, you're in this you're in the coach and you can open up like the deductions window basically and all the clues and stuff. So it's a good way to 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 do keep yourself busy during the the screen loading time, which I really liked. So, like you right. can pull up, so you can like while you're like even though like, while the stuff is moving around, you can do some work as uh, figuring out the, the mystery and stuff. So I was, I guess I was playing that game. I was thinking like, what if I turn my, and my, 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 my books could have like a similar mechanic or a similar, similar style or something like that. I don't know. Who knows? Some, yeah. Someone out there is, might, might be able to do something with it. That's very cool. Um, yeah. We're going to take a moment and say, if you want to um, win these two books, I've opened a giveaway in chat. You can, as as the bot says, type uh, bang, exclamation point, magic, if you want to win these two. Um, and if you're listening to this later, I'm probably going to do a uh, giveaway on, I can't say probably, i I, I got to make a decision. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be also giving away a copy of both books to anybody listening later. So you can email me with a giveaway in the title of the email and uh, say you want to win these books so we can uh, get those out to you. I'm very excited to put them in your hands. So uh, you are whirlwind uh, debut author. What kind of advice can you give to our uh, listeners who are not quite at your level if, mm. since you probably remember? <laughs> What, what what beginning writer uh, or beginning yeah. professional uh, information would you give? 
I guess from uh, from anything is that um, can I just have a, a certain schedule for how you, how you write and stuff. And sometimes that I I guess for me, I, since I I work during during the day and stuff, I always have I I kind of have a schedule where it's like you know it's I write it like I write at night, I write weekends and stuff like that, and so I have this block of time. I don't. I don't know. I guess once I'm, when I'm not like doing the first draft, I don't really have a word count. I mean, I think I found over the years that the word count is like it's the elusive. I guess it gives you a sense you're being busy for certain things. But I think as I I always find my all my work is like in the revision part. It's not the drafting is getting it's getting my it's like it's a big large scale brainstorming. I mean, it's me getting words out on the page. Yeah, know? it's all about mm-hmm. revision. And so I'm more I'm more time to dedic- more to dedicating certain amount of times, but also finding some breaks and stuff because I'm really have a really bad habit of like taking my vacation from like my day job is still is me working because I'm working on my my stories, so it's like I try to find some time I try to allow myself to have like time you know to goof off play video games or you know cook or even just do the household stuff mm-hmm. you know that 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 will they'll build up because. If you just if you're working from with stuff all the time, you get burnt out really easily. And try to feel guilty about it because I think this, this particular this past winter break, the winter break holiday and stuff, I had to you know allow myself that feel like feel like I wasn't even though I did I took some like, days off writing and stuff, so I can kind of just you know allow it to my to so fully relax and stuff. But like other advice and stuff, but other than that, it's like you know always carry the like, notebook with you. I mean, I always have like a notebook and like twenty other pens, yeah. some that work, yeah. some that don't, <laughs> that I can have to just grab and jot by. Because there's been times <laughs> I literally woken up from a dream one time and wrote some stuff down in a notebook <laughs> because other just just to have on hand. Yeah, um, yeah. This, and stuff like you know, just write what you like, like to what you really like. Don't try to write to a market yeah. or anything yeah. or trends because. You're gonna at the end of the day, you're gonna you're gonna look at this book at like fifty different times in different fifty different ways, and you gotta have write, write something. If you, if you write something you don't really like, you're gonna end up hating this book by the end of it. And you, I mean, you might still do anyway if you write something you like anyway. But mm-hmm. you like you, but you're still like like it a little bit more if you're writing to trace some kind of trend or something like that. Yeah, and I think other stuff is that you just um, you're on social media. Don't. Don't try to compare yourself to other people. Everyone come as everyone's coming at different um different of uh, places yeah. of this stuff, their yeah. journeys. And you know, you also see you're seeing a curated view of things. You're not seeing the behind the scenes because that's that's a quote I've read what some I read remember reading somewhere is that you're seeing all your behind the scenes stuff of behind the stage. Mm-hmm. And you're mm-hmm. seeing everyone else's like for pristine for presentation. But they're probably as messy as you are behind the scenes too. But you're not seeing that. And try it's a good thing to kind of remember that. And, and in the cases when you do feel the stab or like jealousy or envy, try to pick, instead of just trying to dwell on those feelings, think about why you're feeling that, whether, whether it's like someone getting a deal or, or doing certain things. And, for, and think, take it as more figuring out how, they, how you want to figure out how do you to get, want to get that same thing, basically. Yeah. Try to make it more yeah. productive in a sense, because it's really easy, especially with all information being bombarded at you on social media, to get to those deep down those negative feelings because. It's it's easier to succumb to those certain things instead of like uh, trying to just twist it around and try to make things a little bit better, I guess. And yeah, and and as always, rejections are always you get rejection for everything. Rejection just mean you're doing something. Yeah, I mean someone <laughs> someone sees saw you enough just to tell you no, and that doesn't mean you get, doesn't mean it doesn't mean you have to stop. It just it's just basically you're getting somewhere. Exactly, and thank you for reminding me because we did have some good news come in at. Uh, after we'd moved on and I'm going to go to that scene real quick because thanks to uh, Litropod, our rejection numbers go up. Congratulations, mm-hmm. belated Litropod, two audiobook mm-hmm. rejections. Mm-hmm. So team rejections numbers go up twice. Well <laughs> done. Uh, we're hitting the yay button for that for sure. Uh, Southpaw and Shards had some good news. As well, I forgot what those are. I apologize. If you want to say so in the in the chat, tell me. If not, just congratulations, yay, yay button hit. Very good. Um, one thing I loved about what you said. Um, sorry. One thing I loved about what you said was um, not knowing what other people are going through, and they may may not have yours. I actually had that discussion with a friend of mine. I was whining that. A, a mutual friend of ours was being very 
productive and mm. she's just like are they the um, majority are they the main caregiver of a child are they the main driver of a kid or do they yeah. have your uh, mental health issues or physical health issues yeah. and I'm like okay yeah I guess I guess my situation is unique to me and I just need to do the work that I can do and stop comparing myself to other people yeah it's it's hard if it's it's yeah it's really hard but it's always it's always good to remember it's like try to focus on yourself <laughs> because if you do it compared to everyone else it's, it's not going to end basically there's always something to be jealous about someone if you get to you follow if you go, go along that path but yeah it's yeah it's it's one yeah. of those things yeah although i do still say i'm angry at anybody who takes a uh, historic <laughs> male creator and says uh well tolstoy had a bunch of kids and he still wrote oh, yeah. a bunch of stuff and i'm like oh yeah how much oh, laundry did tolstoy do <laughs> did he cook anything yeah <laughs> yeah did he, who, how many servants did he oh yeah, yeah i could i could i could probably rant about that too yeah it's the, un, the, uh, the unseen unpaid labor yeah exactly that that's not there yeah but uh still it it, it matters how um yes you view yourself and cut yourself some slack. Mm -hmm. um, hey, Daniel, good to see you. Thanks for the follow. Um, yeah, we have, uh, if anybody just joined us, we do have a giveaway going on. Uh, exclamation magic will get you in the drawing to win uh, Nicole Glover's two games, or two, we're talking <laughs> about games, sorry, two novels, which yes. are The Undertakers and uh, The uh, conductors, and I don't know why I'm holding it up to the camera because the covers are there on the screen. Um, so, what's next for you? Are you doing another one, or uh, you did say you're working on a first draft kind of uh, in the sloppy phase yeah. right now? <laughs> yes. I can't say much more than that. I can't say anything okay. officially. I have, to be, I have to be coy right now. <laughs> Totally understand. That's yeah. very fair. It's hard. It's really hard to uh, know when to talk about what you're working on. Yeah. But we definitely. But, Sorry. Yeah, I've been, yeah. I've, I always like to stay busy and stuff. Anyway, even like last year, like after I turned in the Undertaker, so I was like, I need to write, I need to write something new. I, I call it my palette cleanser. cleanser. Oh, okay. So it's like you know, I just wrote something just to, to write some stuff. I'm always playing around. I think. I guess I don't know if that I always have a bunch of different ideas that get on like a my little short list of stuff that I want to write eventually. And some of that list gets it gets changed. Like I changed my mind about maybe I won't write certain things. Like I wanted at one point write a middle grade fantasy novel, mostly because you know I like a lot of the middle grade books I've been reading lately. But I think I tried <laughs> writing one, I guess back in 2020, and it just didn't pan out <laughs> the way I wanted to. Like I like the characters, like the world, so like put that on the back burner. I might get to that eventually. But so basically, it's on the list with other ideas that kind of come across because it's the, the fun thing about. Um, so I got into listening to more podcasts mm -hmm. recently, particularly like like you know science and history based and like other eclectic topics in that kind of field. Right. And so I, the thing is, listening the downside of listening to those things, I get all these ideas from this, listening to these random stuff. Like, yeah. Like there's something like this, you know. I think I read. I think I listened to a podcast the other day talking about how I guess vampire interest in vampires is tied to tuberculosis, basically, because you know there's the blood and stuff. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And it's like, and I was like, oh, what if I do like a, a historical send off to like vampires? Even though I tend, typically don't really like vampires as a genre, but taking this little twist of like taking that disease aspect of it was like intriguing to me. And so I basically like maybe maybe it's like a potential question mark. I don't know if I ever get to that, but it was just little things like that just kind of pop up. It's like oh, I just make it make kind of a little list of projects to be. But I, I always like to have something going on because I, I guess because since I work during the day, I'm like I always feel like I don't have enough time to do all the people who work full time. Mm -hmm. I mean, write full time basically. So I always feel have that thinking like I'm not productive enough. Yeah. <laughs> Even though I'm technically doing two jobs. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm lucky that I don't have to take for anyone else mm -hmm. besides me. So I have that. that I'm better looking at that aspect of it. But at the same time, I'm like, I, if I, I keep thinking I'm going to have, if I, if I were able to write full time, I'll be able to write so many books. But then I do, <laughs> when I, then I do this, when I take off time from work and I have this full time writer life for like, you know, those few days of like vacation time, I was like, I don't know if I really like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I maybe because I get conditioned, like I write in the evening. So like my days when I'm off, it's like, you know, I'm just kind of, you know, lying around, you know, not, yeah. not doing as much writing as I would have done, done usually. Yeah. <laughs> that's, fun. that's, that, that's kind of my thing too. I, I, uh, because of layoffs, I've been working from home for a while. It wasn't necessarily a choice, but then I started making it kind of work. Um, yeah. But the the people underestimate the demands yeah. on your time that other things will crop up. And sometimes it's just your own resistance and uh, procrastination like popping up and saying, well, yeah, you could write, but look at all that stuff you can be doing. And during a pandemic, that's harder because it's better. Yeah. It's like nice if you leave your house to mm -hmm. go write, but that became more difficult for us to do safely. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's easier. Uh, the, the quote I'm thinking of is the, uh, if you need one thing done, ask somebody who's got a hundred things on their to-do list, not somebody who has nothing because the person yeah. with a hundred things could probably fit it in somewhere. Cause that's clearly <laughs> what they do. They may not mm -hmm. like you anymore, but yeah. but yeah, it's, it's staying busy is, is a good thing. I've finally started, uh, sticking to a routine, which is why I've mm -hmm. finally had some good solid word count this year. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, the routines and the... Also, you can't... It's like writing that long is just exhausting. It it mm -hmm. makes your it brain is. feel like a, a wrung-out sponge kind of thing. I think the most I wrote one session... Like, I was looking at like, the weekend day. I think I got to close to 7,000. Wow. I think it was, I was... Because I was like, it was... It was one of those days I was like near, I was like, I had a lot for this scene in particular, because it was like a big scene. So I had a lot of words. The words came easier because it's like a, a scene that I had a good idea about. And that's probably the most I'd done like in one session. I mean, it was like throughout the day. It was throughout the day. It wasn't like within like two hours or something oh, sure. like that. It was though, throughout like, you know, a weekend day. You know, I, I mean, I, I would probably maybe start because you know, I, I usually think that a little bit later than I should on weekends, but you know, yeah. but you know, this, it was, that was probably long as I'd done like a, a particular, a single writing day basically. And it was, I felt a little bit tired afterwards. And so when I see people talk about, you know, 10,000 stuff, I'm like, you just gonna hurt yourself. Yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I, I guess I guess I always I guess I say, but I always have like goals that kind of do it and stuff. Like whenever I do, whenever I'm drafting, I do have like a I have like you know minimum goal like you know two thousand for like work days and stuff that I can do fairly easily because sometimes I'll, I might outline like an like, idea of a scene or at least I like, have like a, a few notes so that kind of helps. I think I always I don't think I think the idea is like if you, if you have like kind of like a little little outline or like idea of a or a sketch to the scene basically. It's easy to get those word, word count goals because you you're not just writing uh, writing without like a map basically. Yeah. But I've done. I, I always feel the difference. Like when I'm just writing, this getting the words coming out, and sometimes I can get some stuff out, but it's not as as much as I could if I had at least a few words of a scene already jotted out on my notebook, even as messy or something like yeah. that. But yeah. yeah, and that's why yeah. I usually always say I end up outlining eventually, even though I don't start out outlining a book. I might hit that third, a uh, third, third wave part of the book. I have to outline right. just to know, right. just to know where I'm going. Yeah. Um, we got about 20 seconds or 15 seconds left in the giveaway. Okay. That would be uh, exclamation point magic. Get it in there if you haven't already. And the giveaway is going to close in about five. And Dice Lily <laughs> says, I love writing out the scenes you have firmly in your head. It's like downhill slope on the roller coaster. Yeah. It yes. is nice. And there's always, I always have like, there's always a couple scenes in these books that I have. There's scenes I'm basically writing towards that, like, I want to. That's how I know I'm done with. I'm done with the draft. I'm, I, once I have these certain scenes written down, I know that I'm done with the first draft, basically, or done with this particular revision of the draft because I got this. You got these scenes down, and especially when I'm writing towards, when it actually makes it a little bit go faster because it's, I, I'm really anticipating getting to that moment and stuff. So yeah. Having this, yeah, I guess it's kind of a, having a goal post or a sign marker, I guess, sign post. Right. That's true. <laughs> uh, we're going to go ahead and pick the winner um, by random chance in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. Who do we got? Kay Kimmy has won. Awesome. Oh, uh, Kay, congratulations, Kay Kimmy. I'll uh, email me your, I probably have it, but just in case, email me your address and I'll get these in the mail to you. And uh, I like this whole giveaway thing. It's fun. Yes. Uh, 
we can wind down. I've, I've had you here for an hour, but um, can you tell me what, what are you reading now? And what, what did you read in 2021 that you would recommend? Oh, I guess the reading. I actually just finished um, the the book of the cats who saved books. It's a translation of a Japanese novel that's been out for a few years now. And so it's really short. I actually just finished it. Yeah, just just yesterday, I think. And that was that was kind of fun because you know it's it's, it's kind of a, a it's kind of like a, a kind of a, a, a parable fairy tale kind of thing. You know, talking about the love of books, that sort of thing. And it was just, it was a nice little short, little short read and stuff. Cause I think I've been reading a lot of different nonfiction stuff, kind of research related that it was a nice little switch to kind of a little fiction thing mm -hmm. between the things of like, as of other things of, I think also of other stuff, you know, I can't, I guess other, I guess as other, as other books I probably read on um, the last year that stand out. Um, uh, yeah, it's, things I really liked was Master of Jen by E. Jelly Clark, which it was mm -hmm. a, which yes. I was really anticipating because I, I loved his short novel novellas of the, in that world before and I was really excited to really like to dive into the, the full size novel for him. That was great. No, he's he's, a, he's incredible. Yeah. I, I, I'm always I'm impressed not... by his yeah. yeah. I, had, I was impressed by his novellas because there's just so much in that short amount of space mm -hmm. and it just leaves me <laughs> I'm just I'm so impressed by it because I have a really hard time writing short things, and I'm like I'm just I was impressed how much he got in the, all that world building and stuff. So it's like it was it was fantastic, and that was that was a big standout for me. It was it was, I always had a few books I'm really anticipating for you, and I was really glad to have that one really meet my expectations. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. stuff. So it's that was a big standout for me. I think oh, as other things, I always read I always try to read different other things, but I was I'm not. I was, and I was really bad. I was really, really bad. I feel like I should be recommending a bunch of things. It's not you like know, I, whenever I mean, people ask me that, my brain yeah. just turns off. So I, I fully understand. <laughs> like, read. I have, did, I, I, have I read anything? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I actually was able to read a few through my one of the libraries. I've because I have I got several library cards because <laughs> I moved different places. Oh wow. One of the ones that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a little trick you have. If you have any longs are active, you can hook up cook them up for Libby or something. Mm -hmm. And anyway, one of the ones I had, they had a bunch of, they began a lot of mangas, basically. I think I've read Spy Family, which was like, basically, a, it's like a, so they basically undercover as like a family, as, as, a spy, as either spies or different, like not normal, normal people, but they're like pretending to be a family. And it's like all this, the, the tension of being spies and lying to each other. It was kind of fun. And I think I'd also read, um, apparently the creator of the Full Metal Alchemist came out with a, a, a magna retelling of, I guess, I think it's Legend of Arslan. Arslan. I think it was recently an anime, but it's like it's based off some Japanese fantasy novel. I think I've read the I read the first the first few volumes of that particular series, and I, I really like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I read that most recently because it's I most I was mostly curious about like what she does next and stuff. And I was like, you know, it was, that was kind of fun. It was like a, I think it's like a, you know, it's a kind of a, like a high fantasy kind of. I think kind of. I want to say it's like fictional Persia because some of the names seems like that, but it's like basically like portrayal. Like there's a young prince that's collecting, you know, party members, you know, I guess save his kingdom or something like that. And I don't know. There's, I think it's always always a few comics and stuff that I read every so often. But that's I read a lot a bunch of comics through Hoopla. Right. Which is another right. little library system, which is a god a godsend <laughs> for all the comics I want to read because. I, I'm not a big, yeah. I'm not a big buyer of comics. I'm really particular. I, I end up reading, I guess what you used to say more like a, like trades and a, a graphic novels in a sense. I'm not really big on the, even though I do like, I do enjoy the occasional Marvel DC. I gotta, I guess because it's just so many, it's so defragmented. Like, cause I like the continuity of certain series and stuff. But anyway, Hoopla gives me access to every, all those different comic stuff. And so I've read a bunch of different ones. And it's always kind of funny seeing what's, Gets advertised because with all the new Marvel shows popping up, I'll see suddenly on the hoopla the new like the, the old the Hawkeye comics or like the What If comics. They really mm -hmm. old What If comics are all popping up recommended on the hoopla. Oh, I bet, yeah. It, it's always fun. Like or when the when the old guard came out, 
I won this, was it last year or the year before? Oh, when the movie I came out. I don't even the, know the, what time is, but, but I did see yeah, it. Yeah, but when, anyway, when that comic, when the movie came out, the comic was suddenly being recommended on Hoopla again. It's, it's, it's always interesting because it's always, it's always fun. Like, if anything else is going on, because Hoopla used to do this thing where, like, when a celebrity died, <laughs> their, their banner would pop up on there. I guess they took it down, but someone must have complained because that's actually how I found out Carrie Fisher had passed. Oh, because oh. I was just topping up on on Hoopla, and suddenly the one of their top banners thing was like remembering Carrie Fisher, and I was like, "What?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what? yeah. it was like more accurate, I guess, quicker than news or something like that. <laughs> but yeah, that's yeah. All this, I have this bunch. I have so many different like uh, access to stuff, so it's kind of fun. But it's mostly in between, like all the not research and stuff, uh, stuff I'm doing reading. I actually put in. That's what been. I actually just pulled and put on hold a bunch of like more research books to go along to read alongside. Cause I like to research while I'm writing. Mm-hmm. So I, and so in between, I guess my research jobs, I try to have some like lightweight books between stuff. And I, I'm, I guess I, I spent. I think I spent a lot of time just rambling about things I'm reading or not reading. I'll give you really great. good answers. But no, I'm trying to read the... to be read pile to be higher. So. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm really particular about certain books a lot of times. And sometimes and sometimes I'm not particular. There's not always a, a, I guess there's an economy. Someone, I guess some one author was saying, like, once you become a working writer, you don't really have time to read too many particular books, keep up all of them. Even though I try to do my best to keep on top, top of, like, all the stuff, because I usually check out my, my like, my Libby, like, through the libraries and stuff, see what's coming out and stuff. That's a good way to kind of collect things. And there's, oh, there's always audiobooks. Mm-hmm. and stuff and i'm trying to find some like older audio so i guess i'm noticing a lot of like older books like i've been coming into like audio audio books audio books now or i guess because whatever deals been brokered on the back end and stuff i'm trying to find the good ones but the thing is a lot of times i guess with i guess because i, I read faster than than listening and stuff but i always have to, i'm really particular about audiobooks sometimes right. and i got it i never like to listen to nonfiction on audiobooks like because I, I like to be able to skim and jump around sure and in this fiction, particularly with them at the, I have to make, I don't be investing a certain amount of hours and stuff. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's, I basically, I take my stories, whatever best way it interests me at that time. Yeah. If, if that's, if that, that's not the way to say anything, but it's, you know. All right. Well, we have uh, one more stream raiders to do, and yeah. then I believe we can uh, bid Nicole farewell. If anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, most everybody's agreeing with your uh, book choices, so yes. it's. Uh, I was curious if you had, uh, if you like any horror comics. I'm not. I'm not really big in horror in general. I'm. I, it's. It's. It's funny. I think that when, I guess when like the Jordan Peele's movies like the uh, Get oh, Out yeah. and Us came to theaters, I, I ventured out because the trailers intrigued me and. I think it's sitting before the previews for like other horror films reminded me horror is not my yeah. genre, genre like and stuff. So I, I, it depends. So sometimes I, it's, I think I, cause I most of the interested in looking into more because I saw the documentary for like black horror that came out. I guess it was, it's been out for a few years. I was able to catch it. Finally, this piece of the history of like, like black, uh, black people in horror films mm-hmm. and kind of with adjacent science fiction, fantasy, science fiction stuff too. It got me interested in the kind of looking, looking into more like older stuff and looking at what's being, and also what's being t- come out coming out now. But, but in general, horror is not really the genre I go first to. Right. What's well, definitely not my strength for writing, but it's something I like to dip my toe in occasionally just to see what's out there because I always like to see what's, what's out there in different genres. Yeah. For some reason, I like horror comics more than prose or uh, mm. or movies or something. I don't know why. Uh, you just brought up the Japanese, um, the manga you read and reminded me of my favorite horror comic is, uh, horror comics are from, uh, Junji Ito. So, um, anyway, thank you everybody for hanging out in the chat and, uh, being an awesome audience. Nicole, thank you so much for coming on and, uh, talking to me about so many awesome things. Uh, remember the books are, uh, The Conductors and The Undertakers. Very glad to have you here. Yeah, I'm glad to be, but it was fun to just, you know, talk about, talk about things in general. I, 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 I can ramble on, as you, as you can tell. Oh, no, it's time. great. It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, we didn't get a chance to do our, like, half-detailed and half 
free fall, but that was just awesome uh, yeah. overall. So the mm-hmm. the uh, the feed people get an extra long episode this month. Congratulations, or this <laughs> episode. And uh, Nicole, you've been fabulous. Thank you so much. Remind us of your URL, please. At Nicole-Glover.com. Excellent. And everyone in chat is is saying thank you, Nicole. They're very grateful for all your advice to you, you. Like I asked for one thing and you just gave me like <laughs> four, which was fantastic. Of course. Um, I'm definitely going to check out the cat who saved books. That's re- looked really cool. I should be writing. It's available to you under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Theme music by John Anilio. Art by Numbers Ninja. Production by Summer Brooks. And hosting by Libsyn. Find all of this information and more at merverse.com. And remember, we can't do this without you. Thanks for your support. Doctor Who. Yeah, I'm sitting home watching Doctor Who.